And today I want to make sure that we recognize the impact that Saginaw Future has made for all of us in this area. In the last few years, I've spent significant time on the road speaking to investors and external stakeholders. We've had a lot to explain, starting with who on earth we are. Not only are we Chinese-owned, but owned by a state-owned enterprise. That alone brings an added level of complexity. We're US-based. We have to explain where Saginaw, Michigan is. We're talking largely to young Asian investors who don't drive cars, and I've listened to Joe Perkins explain the intricacies of vehicle steering character. It should be videoed, I'll bring it next time. But in 2010, everything changed. We became the largest Chinese investment in the global auto industry. <laughs> In 2010, there was no precedent for something like this. There have been bigger deals in, since then, but at that point, there was no template, nobody for us to look at as an example. We had a lot of things to learn to make this East meets what Midwest marriage work out. It does not automatically come together. But as one life lesson, I would share with you that you learn the most from people most unlike you. During chapter 11, we were rescued by people we did not know well. It was an act of faith on both sides. We had a lot to learn together. But uh, beyond that point, we become a very collaborative, successful little team. In my assessment, we had always had compelling product developed here in Saginaw. We spent years refining a global manufacturing footprint that could be viable. It was ownership stability that we lacked and that's what they brought to us. Well, let me take you back to the beginning, 1906, just down the road, the Jaycox plant at the corner of Niagara and Hamilton. There we made the steering for Buick. And in fact, here you can see a photograph from 1917. This is a, a Buick Roadster. This is on its way to Garber Buick, and if you look carefully, the driver is Herb Spence, and if I've done the math correctly, in my head, he's 23 years old. Thank you, Herb. 1942, this is a photograph of some engineers working on a machine gun, which might seem odd, but again, just down the road, we began in 1937 to make machine guns for use of the U.S. military. Our initial contract was for 280 units. By the end of the war, we had produced 412,000 units at one-fifth the targeted cost. All done in Saginaw, and in fact, there were multiple manufacturers of this gun, but they turned to us as it was the most precise and reliable device they could buy. 1956, the Buena Vista Complex, Plant 3 is shown here, the first of several plants on that site. What I'd highlight, though, about this site that makes it specifically unique to us is it's the one place in the world where we do all of the heavy lifting with engineering. On this site, we can conceive, develop, prototype, uh, manufacture, receive return product analysis, and ensure that we're building viable modules that can be deployed around the world for other use. And for many years, we operated as the Road S, the Saginaw Steering Gear, the Saginaw Division, and then Delphi Saginaw. And you might remember that GM bundled up the 10 for the six divisions. We were the smallest of the six, with about 10% of Delphi revenue. And with Delphi, we entered Chapter 11 restructuring. Now, at that point, Delphi divided these divisions and the specific sites into two groups. Keep sites that would have a future, and sites that would not have a future. And they called us something unique, strategic but non-core. We don't really know what that means yet today. <laughs> but if I can share a life lesson with you, if anyone ever labels you strategic but non-core, your life will change in ways you cannot imagine. I couldn't have written the story of what would happen next, private equity and buyers coming out of the woodwork. In fact, at the beginning, we had 81 suitors that wanted to do something with us. Uh, competitors, entrepreneurs, and all of that led us to the Delphi chapter. And again, everything changed in 2010 under new ownership. We've learned a lot since then, and for today, I'll just tell you, we're really grateful to be alive, to have a future, and to be here with you today. 
just a minute uh, next year by the numbers. We're going to announce our global revenue next month in Hong Kong. I'll just scale you from 2015 revenue at 3.4 billion US dollars with a workforce of 13,000 employees. North America remains our dominant point of manufacturing. About two thirds of the revenue shown here in North America comes from Saginaw. Global growth has enabled us to rotate the business in terms of geographic footprint, customer served, and product mix. We produce in the region of consumption to be naturally hedged, to have short supply lines. We don't produce in China and export. It's a common question I get. We produce where product is consumed. We deploy a global bill of design and bill of process that's developed in Saginaw. In the 1970s, just to take you back for a minute, we were General Motors, we had two customers, and one was General Motors. Today, we serve nearly 60 different global OEMs. In fact, if you look at the top 12 OEMs operating in the world today, an OEM is a vehicle manufacturer. We serve 10, 10 out of the top 12. If you go to China, we serve 12 out of the top 12. We're the fastest growing supplier in China at this point. Our engineering footprint is similar. About 60% of global engineering occurs down the road. Saginaw has been very critical to our survival and growth. And I'll give you just one proof point to enforce the importance of our technical capabilities. While we were still in Chapter 11, BMW, for some reason, agreed to drive our car. I don't know why. But we prepared it, they drove it, and told us we won the competition. That led them, in fact, the engineers came to us that night and said, you won the competition, we don't know how, we don't know who you are, we don't know how you got in here. <laughs> and we heard you're bankrupt. <laughs> it was a big day. But so, we had their attention at that point based on compelling product, and we shared our balance sheet and our quality record, and they got to know us and gave us half their global vehicle production that we produce yet today. So Saginaw site dominates in terms of engineering significance, two-thirds of the engineers, uh, and again, the modules that we use around the world are all developed here. There was a headline that was a little bit disturbing a year or so again. Next year's global headquarters is going to move to Auburn Hills, which in fact it has. Let me just scale that for you. That's about 150 people, about 100 were already down there. The big growth remains in Saginaw, and you can see the contrast between 2009 and 2016 in employment here. We've got a significant Michigan payroll, local sourcing from the area. Capital investment in the Saginaw site has been $500 million since 2010. We've made a big commitment to Saginaw. <laughs> Let me just spend a minute on product. This reflects really the range of products we make today. But to simplify it, we basically do two things, steering and driveline. Steering's about 80%, driveline 20% of global revenue. But then within steering, that red circle reflects the importance of electric power steering. This has fueled our growth and really given us a new life. Why would somebody even buy electric power steering? Joe Perkins thinks it costs too much, but people buy it. The reason is legislation in every major region of the world demands it. Legislation requiring increased fuel economy and reduced emission forces the automakers to make technical changes to the vehicle. But when they look at the menu of options, going to engine independent or electric power steering, so no pump, hose, reservoir, saves the mass equivalent of 500 pounds on the vehicle. So there's a value proposition for them that they buy. And this is what's brought us to 2016 with double-digit growth since we did the IPO in 2013. Last year, we completed our 40 millionth electric power steering unit. We'll get to 50 million in November of this year. We steer 9 out of 10 full-size, half-ton trucks and SUVs in North America. This has never happened in the 100 year history of automotive, and Herb Spence would remember this. <laughs> it's never occurred that one supplier could sweep all three domestic OEMs, but we did it with Ford first. 
when nobody else could steer a vehicle at that GBW gross vehicle weight with only 12 volts available. And they were convinced this was the future and they gambled on us first and we launched. And then we launched with GM and then we launched with Chrysler. And in fact, we're working on the third generation Ford and the second generation GM right now. We're on one out of four vehicles in Europe and according to our backlog of business book now, when we reach full volume in Brazil, we'll be on one of five vehicles. I'm gonna change chapters and talk to you about the community impact that I simply state to be, think globally and act locally. 13,000 hours invested by Next Year employee volunteers in 2016, supporting charitable efforts in local communities. More than half of that effort occurred right here in the Great Lakes Bay region. Things like FIRST Robotics, which by the way will be hosted, the statewide competition will be hosted by SBSU in April of this year. <laughs> Global Service Day, Junior Achievement, and a host of initiatives. In 2016, next year received the Lloyd J. Yao Community Involvement Award, exemplifying United Way best practices for corporate citizens. Next year, and United Way go back a long way, a long-standing partnership. Next year, employees have many points of contact. We're in our 10th year of next year in UAW Local 699, working with United Way on project independence, increasing overall mobility and accessibility for homebound residents. Last year, we built 13 ramps, nine in Saginaw County, four in Bay, in the ten, past 10 years, we built 100 ramps in the local area. Since 2013, Next Year has partnered with Habitat for Humanity to perform the Brush with Kindness projects in the Vista Township. Things like painting, landscaping, installing windows, and so forth. Last year, we, we completed nine home projects. And we work with United Way Saginaw on a range of activities under the umbrella of Global Service Day in Saginaw County. These represent just a few of the points of contact. Next year, employees giving personal time to support others in the local area. There's another half of this effort that occurs globally in Europe and Asia. I'm not gonna take you through those examples, but it's a significant body of work. I wanna say that the work done here in Saginaw really sets the example. The center of community outreach is here. And like you, these people lead by example, they're mindful of best practices they share. We learn from each other. Like you, they're service leaders, servant leaders. They put others first. So in 2016, 390 volunteers worldwide, four continents, five time zones, 1,300 hours donated to local initiatives. Countless lives touched, and frankly, we're thankful to have the ability and the opportunity to serve. One final chapter, I want to share what we can read together today. I could have never written a script again on what's happened to us in recent years. Bankruptcy, in fact, two times. Ownership change, radical shift in technology and growth. But we know the world will continue to change around us. And it just reminds me what we say in Norwegian. I don't actually know how to say this. <laughs> but I know what it means. There is no bad weather, only bad clothes. <laughs> so why would I say that? Reading the economic environment is a lot like reading the weather. I can pay attention to the season. I know my latitude, the forecast, past experience. And I can use judgment to plan for the day. And with that in mind, we think about next year 2.0. So just as a situation assessment, we're the number one steering supplier in North America. We're the only chassis supplier located in uh, Michigan for headquarters. And it became really visually evident to me at the North American International Auto Show, AKA the Detroit Auto Show last month. This is an opportunity for us to be present, to interact with uh, many people and beyond our normal activities, we participated in the first ever automobility. So there's the auto show and next door automobility in a pretty expansive space with many tier one suppliers demonstrating. And what's happened here is with the advent of ADAS and uh, vehicle autonomy, 
The consumer electronics show has taken increasing importance and relevance because these entrepreneurs are all going there. So this is an attempt to bring them to Michigan during the auto show, particularly where it's auto-focused. So there we had a driving simulator that brought about great industry interest, simulating autonomous driving experience. And it's, it's a simulator that we built ourselves across the river. On day two, we took the main stage with Continental to, be, to announce a technical joint venture that we will do with them to work together on autonomous vehicles. And we showed a Chrysler 300 that demonstrates our new quiet wheel and a stowable column, industry first, that will become very relevant for a cockpit that needs extra space when vehicles can drive on their own. So this relationship with Continental is important to us. Basically, autonomous vehicles need two things. They need longitudinal control, engine, powertrain, brakes, and they need lateral control, steering. Conti lacked one Lego, and it was the lateral control that we could provide. And it was just amazing to watch. These two companies that are so different in size, Conti about 40 billion, next year about four. But on the stage that day, we really looked like equals, 50-50 partnership. There'll be a new technical facility south of here where we'll start with 24 engineers to work specifically on the interaction of longitudinal and lateral control for vehicle autonomy. And if there's one thing I'd have you think about for the future for us, it's ADAS, Advanced Driver Assist Systems. This is the next game changer. The industry is pretty much completing this technical conversion to engine independent electric steering. This is what's coming next. There are no significant volumes. We're making substantial investment because we believe this is what comes next. And the way I would divide opportunities is into three parts. The first two, concern conventional OEMs or automakers and these crazy disruptors that largely come from the West Coast. So if you line them up vertically, you see the kind of customers we're used to, and across the time top, you see the crazies that we don't quite know what to do with. But what's happened in the last 12 months is there are intersections. FCA has partnered with Google to develop an autonomous car. That's a significant intersection, and the vessel that they chose to work on is the Pacifica minivan. And providentially, we steer every Pacifica minivan, so we're at the table with FCA, Chrysler, and Google. And those are two very different cultures. They talk about getting product on the road, and Chrysler's got their requirements, A, B, C, D, for validation, and Google's like, let's go. We made a test, and we'll make updates when we crash. <laughs> Please don't write down that as a quote. Uh, just, just trying to strike a contrast there at the table. But, I mean, we're so privileged to be there in the middle of that conversation and, uh, and be relevant. These vehicles are on the road. There'll be a first fleet of 100 driving around, and we will steer everyone. There's another intersection between GM and Lyft, the ride-sharing service. Uh, GM made a half-billion-dollar investment in Lyft and want to provide vehicles to Lyft drivers with favorable financing. And they want these to be have autonomous capabilities. Now the vessel they chose, providentially, is the GM Bolt, and we steer every Bolt. So we're at the table again, working on this all-electric vehicle that's really quite phenomenal when you look at the range capability and the price point. They'll bank thousands of these, not big numbers, but we're planting seeds here where we think they can grow and we'll be on every one. So then Uber, that's been a completely different low capital business model, has decided that they need autonomous cars. The reason they give is in emerging markets, they can't find drivers fast enough and they want to eliminate that constraint. There are other reasons that they might want to have autonomous vehicles. And it's not going quickly They've identified three potential OEM partners, Ford, BMW, and Volvo. We provide half of all BMW steering, and Ford selected us to be their ADAS supplier. So this one's the newest, the least developed. But while we have a few minutes together, I just want to give you a sense for the changing landscape and the way that we have to operate. 
So then we come to collaborative peers. And I'll just come back to this continental example. This is a real opportunity for us. There are a couple of others in the wings, but this is the one that I would share with you. It's really an opportunity for us to do something different. And you know we're different. They're big and capable, and they walk with a swagger, and we don't. You know, a little scary. They think longitudinally, we think laterally. But we're doing some great things together, and I'm just reminded. You learn the most from people most different than you. So as we continue down that path, we continue to call Saginaw home, and we'll continue to make our investments here and ensure that we've got a future in this area. And I'll just go back to where we started. We're celebrating the milestone event today, the 25th anniversary of Saginaw Future. Thanks for sharing your day with us.